One of the hardest things when you're trying to affect change is that people like this gentleman are right. The questioner framed it as a specific issue, calling Jobs basically an idiot for what he was doing. What Jobs has done is he came back and he reframed that. So one of the toughest things for any founder to do is deal with a tough question, something that they don't want to answer. Today, I want to break down how one of the best did it, Steve Jobs. He got hit with a tough question, to say the least, back when he was coming back to Apple and explaining how he was going to do some things. And so in this video, I'm going to break down this about five minute clip and show exactly how he was able to navigate and not only answer the question, but actually succeed in getting buy-in from the entire crowd by going directly at this question. So let's dive in. Mr. Jobs, you're a bright and influential man. Here it comes. <laughs> it's sad and clear that on several counts you've discussed, you don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> I would like, for example, for you to express in clear terms how, say, Java, in any of its incarnations, addresses the ideas embodied in Open Doc. And when you're finished with that, perhaps you could tell us what you personally have been doing for the last seven years. You can actually hear the crowd say, ouch. But then what Jobs does when you're watching this is one, he sits there and stays in silence. He doesn't try to rush in, he doesn't get offended. And in fact, he actually uses his water bottle as a tool to buy more time. One of the things about answering tough questions is you don't wanna rush into it. You want to take time to really think through what is the answer that I wanna give? Because when you respond immediately, it typically ends up being an emotional response. So we wanna get out of the emotional side and stay cool, calm, collected in the way that we answer. That's exactly what Jobs is about to do right here. Uh... You know, you can please some of the people some of the time, but one of the hardest things when you're trying to affect change is that people like this gentleman are right in some areas. Now this right here is a really interesting move because he acknowledges that the tough question, the insult, was right in a lot of ways. So what he's doing is he's taking the high ground. One, he's acknowledging and saying, yeah, this guy's right. When you do that, you've given them something. So all of a sudden it creates a sense of buy-in from that person. He says it's part of this bigger thing. When you're trying to do something great, you're going to upset some people. And so what he's done is he's reframed the question. The questioner framed it as a specific issue calling Jobs basically an idiot for what he was doing. And now he's going to change the way that he carries on the conversation because he's created that frame. The person who controls the frame controls the conversation. The person who controls the conversation controls the outcome. That's what Jobs did right here. I'm sure that there are some things OpenDoc does, probably even more that I'm not familiar with, that nothing else out there does. And I'm sure that you can make some demos, maybe a small commercial app that demonstrates those things. The hardest thing is, what, how does that fit in to a cohesive, larger vision that's going to allow you to sell um, $8 billion, $10 billion a product a year? And so this right here, Jobs is going into rhetorical question, which is a way to get people to think about the frame differently. He says, you could be thinking about it this way, but here's how we think about it. And he gives the frame, thinking about the long-term vision to be able to sell eight or $10 billion worth. So much of it, again, is the frame that we are positioning. And, and Apple and Steve Jobs specifically is famous for thinking in really long-term horizons. Whereas a lot of people try to constantly put out new features, new products, new ideas. Jobs is always thinking, five steps ahead. And so what he's doing here is he's leaning into that visionary aspect of who he is as why he is the person that's right to make these decisions. One of the things I've always found is that 
you've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to try to sell it. And I've made this mistake probably more than anybody else in this room. And I've got the scar tissue to prove it. And I know that it's the case. And as we have tried to <clears throat> come up with a strategy and a vision for Apple, um, it started with what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? Not, not starting with, let's sit down with the engineers and, and figure out what awesome technology we have and then how are we going to market that. Um, so he's answering this rather insulting question in a way by again reframing to everything we do is based on the customer. Thinking about what is best for them, what's the customer going to enjoy the most. He's going back to the core ethos of what Apple is about, the customer. The way that he's communicating this, the way that he's telling the story, answering it, is audience centric, customer centric which allows people to empathize and sympathize with him and say, oh, he's really looking out for the person that he serves. He's not doing this from a selfish point of view. This is why it works so well. Um, and I think that's the right path to take. Uh, I remember with the laser writer, we what he's doing now to make the point stand out even stronger is going into storytelling mode. So he immediately, he gives this answer, reframes everything and then says, I remember, and he's transporting you back to another time where he's about to give a story to highlight the point that he just made. Anytime we're making a point, we always want to tie a story into it because it makes it more tangible and real. And that's what Jobs is about to do right here. Built the world's first small laser printers, you know, and there was awesome technology in that box. We had the first Canon laser printing, cheap laser printing engine in the world in the United States here at Apple. We had a very wonderful printer controller that we designed. We had Adobe's PostScript software in there. We had Apple Talk in there. Just awesome technology in the box. And I remember seeing the first uh, printout come out of it and just picking it up and looking at it and thinking, you know, we can sell this because you don't have to know anything about what's in that box. All we have to do is hold this up and go, do you want this? And if you can remember back to 1984 before laser printers, it was pretty startling to see that. People went. A quick point here, this right, right here is exactly what made Jobs so great. He wasn't trying to sell features, he was selling outcomes. He was selling what the end result was, the benefit. And so many founders, CEOs, especially in the tech world, Make the mistake of trying to sell features instead of selling the outcome, what it does for the customer, why someone's going to be excited to buy it, purchase it, use it. They just care about what can the thing do. And that's what Jobs highlights right here. What? Whoa. Yes. And that's, that's where Apple's got to get back to. And, you know, I'm sorry that Open Doc's a casualty along the way. And I readily admit there are many things in life that I don't have the faintest idea what I'm talking about. So I apologize for that, too. But there's a whole lot of people working super, super hard right now at Apple. You know, Avi, John, Garino, Fred. I mean, the whole team is working, burning the midnight oil, trying to, and, and, and people, you know, hundreds of people below them to execute uh, on some of these things and they're, they're doing their best. And I think that what we need to do, and some mistakes will be made by the way, some mistakes will be made along the way. That's good because at least some decisions are being made along the way. And we'll find- You can see how Jobs really owns up and admits to a number of mistakes. He says, you know, I've made mistakes. I don't know everything. It's a way to, again, create connection to the audience. Because if you try to be perfect, no one's gonna believe you. He sets the stage to say, I'm not perfect, I make mistakes. And he's also taking on some of that leadership burden, shielding everybody from the negativity. He's saying, all of that falls on me, but here's all the people who are working really hard. This is what great leadership communication is about too. That's what a great CEO, a great founder, a great leader does, and that's what Job is doing right here. Find the mistakes, we'll fix them. And I think what we need to do is support that team going through this very important 
stage as they work their butts off. They're all getting calls, being offered three times as much money to go do this, do that, the valley's hot, and none of them are leaving. And I think we need to support them and see them through this and write some damn good applications uh, to support Apple out in the market. That's my own point of view. Mistakes we made, some people will be pissed off, some people will not know what they're talking about, but it's, I think it is so much better than where things were not very long ago. And I think we're gonna get there. So when you pose a tough question, you wanna think about how can you, one, frame it properly, two, acknowledge that person's point of view, and then three, turn it back to your own unique experience and your insight as to why you're making the decisions that you are moving forward. That's what Steve Jobs did here. It's a beautiful example of how to do this. These are the types of moments where leaders shine. And if you follow Jobs' example, you can be one of the all-time greats.